Welcome everyone to uh, Protein 101. I'm glad you've all signed up and that you're here. My name is Ramon Sedano and I am the coordinator for fitness services and education over at the rec center. So I oversee the personal training, weight room, strength conditioning, uh, well-being online department, which is where I'm involved with Global Campus, where I kind of act as the, not kind of, I definitely act as the uh, well-being coordinator for Global Campus within my job position there. I also teach for the kinesiology program here. I've taught classes, uh, right now I'm teaching my Kines 311 class, which is a strength training class, and I've also taught Kines 305, which is nutrition related to fitness and sport. Um, we are going to be talking about protein today, just a, the basics and kind of what protein is, and as I said, like I've taught uh, like nutrition related to fitness and sports. So when it comes to nutrition, my background is much more in the development of protocols and guidelines for athletes, uh, various different anaerobic sports, aerobic sports, wherever they may be at. Um, while that is where my background is with nutrition and uh, developing those kinds of things with athletes, I do have a lot of experience within uh, general requirements and just the general population and those kinds of things as well. So uh, I think I will be able to help with a lot of questions that may, we may have. And with that, um, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in the box. We're going to get to questions more at the end. Uh, I tend to have a tendency to go on tangents. So I believe if I get interesting questions within the uh, uh, lecture itself, I might go off for a while and I don't want to get sidetracked and keep you all here for longer. So with that, what we're here to talk about is Protein 101. Uh, we're going to talk about just really what protein is, the basics of it, what it's not, a little bit of misunderstandings about it, and to try to really give you all an understanding of the mechanisms of it, why it's important, and why it's definitely overutilized and kind of abused and um, definitely not abused but overconsumed. So a lot of the basics, we aren't going to be diving deep into anything supplementation wise or things like that. I'm not a big proponent of supplements, honestly. Uh, hopefully you've all had a chance to watch our intro uh, to nutrition uh, or what was it called? Intro, yeah, intro to nutrition, um, three basic principles of uh, healthy eating that we had here. And one of the main concepts in there is this concept I have called jerk, which is just eat real food. And I prefer to get for me, myself, my clients, uh, anybody that asks me for recommendations for nutritional protocols to get the nutrients I need for my body within real foods rather than supplements. It's important to remember that supplements mean supplemental. It's not what you're supposed to be taking in in the large quantities. If you do have difficulties getting your amount of protein, carbohydrates, or fats in, that's when supplements come into play. So a, a lot of this uh, uh, presentation is going to be talking about how to do this through foods and those kinds of things. Not anything against supplements, it's just typically they're going to put you over the amount of protein that you would need. Um, and definitely a lot of them, which we'll get into a little bit later, even their serving sizes have the amount of protein within them that the body can't even process and utilize all at one time. It's just, uh, it, it'll definitely digest it, but you're going to have a little bit of excess left over. So with that, I'll kind of get into what our uh, agenda is for the day. And let's see if I can make this work. Cool, I made it work. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is just protein misconceptions. And then we'll go into uh, introduction of macronutrients. So protein is a macronutrient. We'll talk about what that means real, real briefly. Uh, we'll talk about the structure and function of protein. So really what protein is made up on the molecular level. We'll get into a little bit of biochemistry. Uh, very, very minimal, I promise. Um, we'll talk about protein metabolism. That's where we'll get into that little bit of biosynthesis and biochemistry of protein. Uh, we will get into the weeds a little bit. Um, I'm going to, uh, it's important to understand what's happening on the, at the uh, uh, meta, uh, metabolic level for you to understand when we are exceeding our limits of protein, why it's detrimental and why it may lead to say fat gain or metabolic byproducts within the system that are not conducive to health and those kinds of things. So the only reason we're gonna be talking about that is to give you an understanding about those things. And I really will try to make it as simple as possible. Um, there's no reason to actually try to really go down to like, we have a double bond here and this breaks here and we added the alpha keto ketoglutarate right here. We don't need to do all that but we will talk about the basic uh, metabolic factors. We'll talk about protein requirements then. So that's gonna be talking about uh, general requirements for individuals. And we're actually gonna break it down also into active individuals and also athletes. Since my background is with athletes, if there's any parents here that have, you know, their kids playing certain sports, if you still are an athlete, we'll talk about different requirements for different athletes also within the different seasonal factors that take place throughout an entire 
uh, annual training cycle for our athletes and how those uh, recommendations and requirements change. Uh, we will talk about very briefly protein uh, with muscular development and recovery. Um, we will talk minimally about protein timing today. It's not as an important factor as many people think. It is beneficial, but it's not the end all be all. And then I'll give some quality protein sources for both, you know, your meat eaters and your vegans out there. And then we'll have a quick review and time for questions. So first, before we get into anything, I like, I call this a word from our sponsors, right? So this is essentially where uh, I get my information from when it comes to nutritional protocols, protein protocols, requirements, and those kinds of things. I do utilize much more than just these uh, kind of resources, but these are the main ones I use. First and foremost, a lot of the requirements and uh, recommendations that we have come from the American Council on Sports Medicine. Um, a lot of articles I pulled specifically for this, um, uh, a lecture was from the Journal of Sports uh, Sciences. I use more, many, that's just, it's one of my favorite journals, but yeah, I use a lot of other journals as well. Then we see up here in the right is the International Society of Sports Nutrition. I'll get a lot of my position statements, position stands, requirements from them, especially when it comes to our athletes. Uh, I would say the dominant portion of information coming in this lecture is coming from the ISSN and then also from the NSCA, which is the National Strength Conditioning Association. Um, that is, uh, I'm a CSCS certified uh, NCA uh, strength and conditioning coach and those kinds of things. And they have very good protocols when it comes to nutritional requirements for athletes. And then the book that I utilize for my uh, nutrition class here within the kinesiology program is this advanced uh, sports nutrition. So I pulled some protocols from there. So just so you know, I'm not pulling a bunch of things out of a bunch of bro science here. I'm actually utilizing information that has been well established for a long period of time. And with that, things are constantly changing, right? Uh, we are actually seeing that the intake of protein can be much higher than what people, what people originally thought. Granted, people still utilize it in a much greater amount, but things are always changing, right? And it's cool that we get these resources to pull information from, but it's also important to stay ahead of the game. And a lot of the information I do actually utilize within my own uh, practices with my uh, athletes and my clients comes from practical application. A lot of this stuff is theoretical, granted they did research, but practically applied sometimes is just a little bit different. So protein misunderstood. So what we see in the field of nutrition or in the field of athletics or just in the field of general uh, recreation and people trying to work out and get what I call all buff and stuff, right? Is um, um, massive overconsumption of uh, protein. Individuals do have it set in their head that protein is the end all be all for a nutrient. It's the most important thing to, you know, coming to protein synthesis and the anabolic factors and the muscle and those kinds of things. And they think the more protein, the better, the more protein, the better, the more protein, the better. And while protein is, you know, a very important substance and nutrient when it comes to the anabolic, which means to build factors of muscle and protein synthesis and all those kinds of things, you do have a point of diminishing return. You're only going to be able to get so much from a certain intake throughout the day and also within an intake at one time. So we do see that most athletes consume more protein uh, than they really need to. And sometimes we even see that this happens into as much as over 700% of the recommended amounts of what, uh, or the, uh, uh, the uh, recommended amounts for these individuals, whether it be an athlete or whether it be a gen pop kind of individual, we see massive intakes of protein, okay? And also with this, we see this massive intake coming from loss of supplementation. Uh, you know, I, again, I don't have anything against protein shakes or anything like that. Again, we need to realize that supplements need to be supplemental to the diet. We should be getting the dominant source of our nutrients from real foods. It's how the body was meant to process these things, break them down and understands how to utilize those nutrients coming in in its uh, uh, metabolic factors and within, in its digestive system. Also, what we do see from a lot of the protein sources out there when it comes to supplements is they are not nearly as nutrient dense and improper amino acid, amino acid distributions as just simple meat. And an example that we kind of get from that advanced sports nutrition book is that one ounce of meat has about 7,000 milligrams of high quality amino acids and amino acids are what make up proteins. Okay, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But typical amino acid supplementations only have per serving around 500 to 1,000 milligrams of amino acids. They may have the same caloric density, so it means they're energy dense, but you're not getting the same nutrient amount of those building blocks of amino acids, which is what we're trying to obtain from the protein. 
So we'd see that an overconsumption definitely coming in the form of supplementation, which isn't even as nutrient dense with regard to the amino acids that we're trying to utilize as the building blocks for those anabolic factors in our body. So we're just kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Also, we know that the body can only process so much protein at one time and process, uh, it, it's gonna digest it all regardless, right? But it's gonna only process it for the factors that we want of uh, protein synthesis and anabolic, uh, in, in, in the anabolic nature of our muscles for with so much at one time and also so much throughout the day. What we see is even on the high end, on the high end, and understand that protein intake and protein processing to, for those anabolic factors and protein synthesis is widely different between individuals, right? Someone who has a lot more muscle mass on their body, who's a much more highly active individual, who's consistently breaking down that muscle and trying to build it back up, is obviously going to need to have a larger amount of protein coming in to support the means that they're doing. Regardless, even with our high end strength and power athletes we see, we typically understand that the max amount of protein they're gonna be able to take at one time in one serving to be able to utilize in an anabolic protein synthesis fashion is 50 grams, which is a, a very, very large amount of protein that we'll see here. A lot of individuals only need to be eating 50 grams of protein throughout the day. But for the most part, we have this range of 20 to 50 grams uh, of protein at one time that's going to be properly processed by the body and utilized for those anabolic factors and the protein synthesis and the buildup of those tissues that have been broken down and things like that. Um, and that range is there for individuals of differing body sizes. Granted, I promise you, a Kai Green or a huge bodybuilder out there, they're going to be able to process more protein at one time. But you're looking at individuals who are gigantic outliers. Most of us are not in the outlier range. So a lot of these supplementations that we have are having that much protein in them per a scoop. So if you only need 25 to 30 grams at one time for you to be able to have those anabolic factors take place, certain things are going to happen to these extra 20 grams that are coming in that is not necessarily beneficial to what you're trying to achieve through protein. Uh, and we'll talk about those things here in a little bit. Um, so put simply, and I took this quote literally from the book, it's put simply, eating too much of any nutrient, including protein, translate into eating less of another nutrient that may, equal, may be equally important and eating too much of a nutrient at one time, which fails to optimize it, okay? So another thing that happens when we're increasing our protein load to these high, high, high uh, intakes is we're probably negating the amount of carbohydrates or the amount of fats that we need to take in. And we're like, oh, well, we'll utilize protein as our energy source rather than carbohydrates. While that can happen, we don't want protein to be our energy source. It is not a, it's, not, it's not a great energy source. There's a lot of things that come, uh, a lot of byproducts that come from it and that it's not a clean, efficient way to do it. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So if we're consistently taking in too much of this substance, we're probably not getting the proper distribution of this other substance. And we want to have a good distribution of these things. So one of the things that we do see very, 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 very com uh, 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 commonly is that protein is just overconsumed, And we're gonna now kind of get more into the weeds of what we can kind of do with these kinds of things. But before that, <laughs> um, we wanna explain what macronutrients are because uh, protein is a macronutrient. And macronutrients are nutrients that the body needs in a large amount, right? And they're energy dense, right? They're energy dense because they have calories in them. So the nutrients that we intake and that we need in large amounts are going to be our carbohydrates, our proteins and our fats. Okay, they are macronutrients because we need them at a large level and because they are energy dense, they have calories in them. Okay, um, carbs and fats are dominantly what we want to be utilizing for our energy production, for the uh, exercises that we do, for the uh, requirements of daily life, for walking, doing X, Y, and Z. And proteins, we want to be utilized for other functions, especially cellular turnover, cellular buildup, protein synthesis, the repair of certain structures within the body, transport of other substances in the body, uh, hormone synthesis, and those kinds of things, right? Uh, our micronutrients are the ones that we need in smaller amounts that are not energy dense, right? Like your vitamins and minerals. They act as uh, kind of the enzymatic factors that allow meta uh, metabolic processes and digest, not digest, well, they do help in digestion, but energy production to take place. So protein is a macronutrient that is needed in larger amounts than our micronutrients, but it's not needed in as much amount, say, as carbohydrates, okay? So just remember that protein is a macronutrient, and that's literally the basics of macronutrients we're talking about today. If you wanna to learn more about macronutrients, you can go into our introduction to nutrition uh, webinar that we've done recently. So now getting into what protein is, and this is uh, something that I feel is important, even for the general public, uh, to understand what protein is. So 
the first thing that we're going to talk about is the chemical compound of protein. We're not going to write it out or anything. Well, I guess it's right there, uh, but we're not going to go through what all these things mean. But there's the, a reason why I want to talk about the structure is because we're going to be hitting on something about it a little bit later. So it's made up of uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the fact that nitrogen is part of this of uh, protein is a very special fact. It's the only macronutrient that contains nitrogen. And there are certain nitrogen molecules in the body that are they're, they're nitrogen dependent, but they're built off nitrogen that amino acids or proteins are going to assist with. So the fact that we have nitrogen in our protein, it makes protein special for certain functions. And again, we're going to talk about those here in a little bit. I'm not trying to jump ahead of myself too much. Now, what needs to be understood is protein is made up of amino acids. So I'm sure that um, uh, you've heard about this before, but amino acids are going to be what we call the building blocks of protein. And there's uh, within the human body uh, and within our uh, nutritional factors, there's going to be 20 amino acids. In nature, there's tons of amino acids. I think there's like 500 or something. But the ones that the body uses, there's 20 total and there's 11 non-essential and there's nine essential, okay? So what essential and non-essential mean? Non-essential means that the body can manufacture it on its own, okay? So it can be produced by the body. Essential means that it needs to be derived from the diet. We cannot manufacture these things on our own, so we have to obtain it from some external source. That's what makes it essential. We need to consistently bring these things in our body or the body is not going to function correctly. Though the non-essential amino acids are called non-essential, that does not mean that they're not essential, okay? That they're very important to the processes that take place in the body. Um, they're absolutely needed in the body for the processes that we need to take place. And the body can deplete in non-essential amino acids over time. There's actually a certain process that we're going to, again, talk about here in a little bit, where when we have an abundance or we have a leftover amount of the essential amino acids that come in the body and we don't need any more of them, they're going to go through a process called transamination to turn them into non-essential amino acids that maybe we're low on at the time, right? So it is important for the body to have the correct pooling of our essential amino acid and non-essential amino acids. Now we spoke about how uh, protein is an energy molecule or an energy nutrient. We see that by this having four calories per one gram of protein. And that's gonna be important when we're talking about requirements and how to figure out how many grams of protein compared to how many calories a day that one should be eating. Because we're gonna talk about this individual needs X amount of grams per kilogram of body weight. And understanding how many calories per gram is going to let you know how many calories of protein you're eating and how many grams of protein that you're going to eat when you figure those kinds of things out. Um, it's also important to understand that for all, uh, so let's back up a little bit. For things, what we're trying to utilize protein for in the body is a myriad of things, but the main one is this whole kind of thing of protein synthesis. So creating proteins and building back up the tissues in the body. So say when we weight train, we put some sort of stimulus on the muscle, it damages the muscle, it breaks it down, and we need protein and amino acid or amino acids and protein sent there to be able to build that back up and make it stronger. Okay, so we're having protein synthesis take place. If we want optimal protein synthesis to take place, we need all essential amino acids present at one time simultaneously to be able to help with the protein synthesis and the build back up of whatever it is, is that we're doing. Okay or even just the protein synthesis of other carrier proteins. We want all those amino acids, all those essential amino acids there at one time, simultaneously too. And the reason I bring that up is a lot of individuals here, well, I can take uh, gelatin to make my hair better, right? And if I just eat a bunch of gelatin, which is a protein or an amino acid and uh, intake that, it's gonna make my hair better. However, you're just taking a single amino acid and it's not going to be as beneficial to what you're trying to do because the other amino acids aren't around at the same time. So making sure to have the whole profile of amino acids to increase and have optimal protein synthesis is ideal for many of the functions or all the functions, honestly, that we're trying to achieve from protein. So when you hear of individuals doing, I'm just gonna take this one little thing for this, right? If it's not prescribed by a doctor, a doctor didn't tell you to do it for X reason, it's most likely not going to be um, as beneficial or provide the same result that you would want if you were having an essential amino acid pool of all those things at one time. And that's just one thing I like to bring up because a lot of individuals don't realize that. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, well, let's talk about dietary protein before we jump to the functions of protein. 
So when talking about dietary protein and eating it, we have these ideas of complete protein versus incomplete protein or high quality versus low quality. All it really means is a complete protein is going to have a complete essential amino acid profile. It's going to contain all the amino acids or it, it, def, it, it contains all of them. Okay. For uh, simple terms. Um, these are complete, right? So we have all amino acids with them. An incomplete or a low quality protein is a protein source that is deficient in one or more of the essential amino acids. So we see that high quality proteins uh, are usually of animal origin and that low quality proteins are typically of plant origin. This is where being our vegan athletes and our vegetarian athletes, they have to figure out how to do complementary proteins and those kinds of things to make sure to get the entire amino acid profile in there. And we'll talk about vegan athletes and uh, individuals later and how they can go about making sure to get all the protein uh, or uh, all the amino acids that they need in. When it comes to the functions of proteins, um, there's multiple things that they can do. And uh, we see that we have structural proteins up here and we have working proteins up here. For the most part, we want our proteins to be used as structural proteins, okay? These are going to constitute cell structures, develop tissue, repair tissue, and maintain tissue. So I do a workout, I break down my muscle, it needs to be rebuilt up, I have the proper amount of protein in my body, it's gonna be sent to that area, to those target tissues, and it's going to rebuild, repair, and then maintain, right? It's not only going to rebuild and repair, it's going to optimize as long as I put the proper stimulus on it to be able to get that little bit of adaptation to take place, okay? Uh, and, and working proteins are great as well, right? We definitely want our proteins to synthesize hormones and trans, uh, neurotransmitters. Some examples of that, like we have hormones that are going to help synthesize insulin. We have proteins and uh, amino acids that are going to help uh, synthesize the neurotransmitter serotonin. And both these things kind of help control bodily functions. I actually just taught our en endocrine chapter in my 311 class recently. And everything when it comes to the hormonal system in the body is essentially bringing the body back to equilibrium, right? Back to homeostasis. So having the proper proteins in there to be able to allow these hormones to synthesize is imperative to the health and this, uh, the health of the system, right? The health of essentially this ecosystem. Proteins also have the ability to be both alkaline and acidic. So they aid in optimizing blood pH. They also aid in uh, maintaining blood fluid, or I mean, uh, fluid volume. And they also do provide energy. Again, we, they are not a great energy source. They are not burned efficiently, nor are they burned without having metabolic byproducts. Regardless though, about five to 15% of energy production, typically more on the low end, is going to come from uh, amino, amino acid oxidation. So utilizing proteins as energy. However, the dominant source of our energy is coming from carbohydrates and fats, depending on the energy levels of what we're doing. And we don't need to go down that route right now. So we don't want proteins to be sources of energy. We want them to build, to repair, to maintain, to transport, to synthesize, to do these things. We don't want to be so low in carbohydrates or fat that we have to turn to protein to go through a process called gluconeogenesis to become a carbohydrate or a glucose to be burned as energy, right? We don't want that. We want to use the more efficient sources. It's a quicker step process, such as carbohydrates and fat in our energy uh, uh, for our energy production. So we've talked about the structure of protein. We've talked about, you know, uh, the functions of it. And it's just important to remember that when we consume proteins, they're going to be turned into amino acids in the body. It's then up to the body to transport those amino acids to the target tissues that need them for specific reasons. And those amino acids are going to be synthesized into proteins that are needed for that target tissue, right? Um, and this is where our kind of protein metabolism comes in, okay? Which is our next slide. Okay, so when it comes to protein metabolism, when we eat proteins, again, they're gonna be broken down into amino acids in our body, right? At that point, some of the amino acids are going to be transported in the blood to target tissues that need to manufacture certain proteins uh, to do certain tasks, whatever it may be. But for the most part, our ingested amino acids are gonna to go to the liver, which is the central processing unit to create and synthesize proteins to be sent out to target tissues that need to utilize them for certain functions. So the liver is where the dominant portion of this stuff is going to take place. Um, granted, there's a lot of individuals out there that talk about that the liver gets uh, uh, too much credit for these kinds of things, but for the sake of this lecture, we're going to talk about the liver is a central processing unit for amino acids, and it is, it is no matter what, no matter who you are, is where the dominant uh, uh, amount of these processes these take place, okay? So we break them down to amino acids. They're going to be utilized for the functions in the body 
okay? So we know that, we know the functions of them. We know that they're gonna use the structural proteins or working protein. But what happens when we have an excess amount of protein? When there's, uh, we've already um, uh, satisfied the functions, the protein synthesis of muscle breakdown, right? So our goal, let, let's use this example. Our goal is to increase protein synthesis and muscle buildup of a uh, tissue of our biceps. We did a bicep workout, right? So we did our bicep workout. Now we consume our protein and we've utilized all the protein that we can uh, at that standpoint for protein synthesis and anabolic factors of the biceps to get built back up. But we took in an extra amount of protein. So we have some stuff left over, okay? So this is where we're gonna kind of get into the weeds of a little bit of biosynthesis and biochemistry and things like that. But it's important to understand these things for some uh, 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 processes or just the idea of overconsumption of protein that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So I have, I have these extra amino acids in the body and amino acids, I have these extra alpha amino acids, okay? So what's gonna to happen to essentially any amino acid in the body is they're gonna go through a process called transamination, okay? All transamination means is it's the transfer of an amino acid into another amino acid. Okay, and we talked about this briefly earlier. So we talked about the structure also earlier of an amino acid. We said it has nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, all those things on it. Okay, so the amino group of the amino acid is what contains the nitrogen. And this is what makes the amino acid special. Okay. Nitrogen on its own is toxic in the body, okay? So there, we have to attach to things and to be able to make it not toxic, all right? Um, so what happens in transamination is it removes the amino group from the amino acid and it attaches it to a carrier molecule, okay? That is going to be able to accept this amino group, okay? And for the most part, this carrier molecule, molecule is called uh, alpha keto glute alpha ketoglutarate, okay? It's an alpha keto acid. And it's typically always alpha ketoglutarate. Um, and we don't really necessarily need to know that. You just need to know that the amino acid is given to a donor or a carrier molecule. At this point, when the amino acid is attached to that carrier molecule, that carrier molecule, molecule becomes glutamate. Glutamate then is able to assist this amino group that has the nitrogen to turn into another amino acid that the body is low on, okay? There's a few things that are happening within this process that I'm, just, I'm gonna leave out. So if you are a biochemistry individual out there, I understand that, but we're just trying to get to the simple standpoint. So essentially in transamination, I'm able to remove the amino group from an amino acid, put it to a carrier molecule, turns into glutamate, and then glutamate is going to assist this molecule, or assist this amino group to turn into another amino acid. And so if the body is low on other amino acids and we have this excess of amino acid coming in and we're no longer able to utilize these amino acids for the protein synthesis of our biceps, right? We're gonna be able to go through transamination to be able to create another amino acid that the body, for lack of a better term, is low on, okay? So what also happens at this point is I removed the amino group, but there's still that carbon structure, what we call the carbon skeleton of that amino acid. So what happens to that? It's gonna turn into some other things that we don't need to get into, but it's going to either be burned as energy or it's going to be stored as fat, okay? If we already have our energy requirements covered and we have this excess protein coming in, then it's going to be stored as fat. Now, what happens when I'm taking in my excess protein, I have now satisfied all the needs for all those other amino acids that I was low on through transamination, but I still have excess amino acids coming in. Well, that's when they're gonna go through the transamination and then the oxidative deamination process. So in the deamination process, this is when I need to get rid of these extra amino acids. And now remember, the nitrogen that is on the amino acid in the amino group is what makes it special. So during oxidative deamination, I am going to remove that amino group and I'm going to turn it into ammonia, okay? Um, it actually goes through transamination, becomes glutamate first, then glutamate turns it back, it's all kinds of things. But we're just gonna talk about that now. This amino group is being turned into ammonia. Ammonia is toxic for the body, okay? So we need to get rid of it. So the body is gonna turn it into something else so it can be transported to where it needs to go and it's gonna go through the urea cycle and it's gonna be turned into urea, which is now not toxic for the body and we are able to pee it out essentially, okay? So that's what happens to that extra amino group that was on the excess amino acids. 
What happens with this, when it's consistently happening, is when we are creating lots of urea and we have to excrete it out because the body wants to get rid of it, we're also excreting out extra fluid of the body, which can possibly lead to dehydration, okay? So now what's going to happen to the carbon skeleton or the carbon structure that was uh, left over from the deamination process? Well, again, just like before, that's going to be either stored as fat, it's going to be converted to glucose, or it's going to be burned as energy. If we are in a caloric maintenance or a caloric surplus, there is no possible way that that, that uh, carb, uh, carbon structure is going to be burned as energy or turned to glucose because we've already satisfied those needs. So we're going to turn it into fat and it's going to be stored as fat on the body. So if you thought taking in excess amounts of protein was not, was only going to build excess muscle, you are incorrect. That excess amount of protein is not only going to cause metabolic byproducts that are dangerous for the body, i.e. ammonia, and that are going to get excreted as urea, which is no longer dangerous, but takes on extra fluid out of it. You also have the ability to store more fat on your body due to the excess intake of those amino acids, okay? And I have this little red note here at the bottom because it's an important thing to remember. So once all protein needs are met, the fate of all remaining amino acids is deamination which again is going to create ammonia, which is going to turn into urea that needs to be excreted from the body. And it's also going to most likely be stored as fat if you have a sufficient amount of glucose coming in or a carbohydrates coming in, or you are in like a caloric uh, a surplus level, right? So this can happen, right? And it's not necessarily the most efficient way to do things. Additionally, utilizing those carbon structures as a fuel source is not an efficient way to get fuel. The carbohydrate turns into glucose or glycogen, glycogen is a stored version of glucose, is a much more efficient and easy way for the body to utilize fuel rather than going through some sort of amino acid oxidation, okay? Regardless, a little bit of amino acid oxidation is happening, right? We talked about that five to 15%, but we don't want the dominant source of our energy coming from it due to these metabolic byproducts, the possible dehydration, and also the storage of fat from those uh, uh, carbon structures. So that's as deep as we're gonna go into that kind of stuff. If you want to learn more about transamination and deamination, stuff's online. It's interesting. Um, it's a very, very complex uh, process, and we're definitely not doing it justice here. But just remember, we can turn an amino acid into another amino group, if we're, or amino, we can turn one amino acid into another, essentially, if we're low on it, and then utilize a carbon structure as uh, energy or possible stored as fat. And if we're completely stored up on the amino acids that we need, we'll go through deamination and then we have ammonia developed and I have to get rid of that. And then we're either utilizing the carbon structure as uh, energy, uh, turning the glucose, which is gonna be used for energy or stored as fat. So with that, um, we will move on to the next slide. And I wanted to talk about uh, protein uh, metabolism first before we got into the requirements of protein. Okay, and that's because I can go back and talk about, uh, I know you love this slide, don't you? <laughs> you just love your protein. Um, but because we're going to see now what the levels are that we utilize for individuals for protein. So now you know uh, individuals who are eating above these levels, which may be surprising because they may be smaller than what people have thought before, what's happening to that excess protein. So you know metabolically what's happening there. So when it goes to protein requirements, I'm giving you a ton of different ways to look at it. So general requirements are going to say uh, for a uh, gram to kilogram ratio, which is a, a more accurate ratio than utilizing percentages, is going to be 0.8 to 1.0 gram per kilogram of body weight. Okay, and this is for general, uh, for general populations, not super active individuals or anyone like that, just general uh, 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 population. So I give an example up here to show you out how much that might be for a 175 pound male. So first I need to figure out, you know, what my weight or what this male's weight is in kilograms, okay? So to do that, you have to go divide by 2.2, right? And then I'm going to times that number by either 0.8 or by 1.0 to figure out what the distribution of protein is going to be. So you see that the distribution is going to be 64 grams to 80 grams of protein, and that's going to be anywhere from 256 to 320 calories, okay? So it's, a, it's not a large amount. And this is what the body is going to be able to process throughout the day well. And we're gonna get on it here in a little bit, uh, talking about distribution throughout the day, but it's much better and more efficient for the body to actually evenly distribute this protein throughout the day or through whatever eating window that you may have. And we'll talk about that more later. Now, the Institute of Medicine uh, has developed what we call the AMDR, the Acceptable Macronutrient Distributions. And this is going to utilize a percentage 
of total daily intake or uh, uh, compared to your total caloric intake of how you're going to identify what your protein needs are. I definitely like doing things off weight and I like them doing them off lean body mass, which we're going to talk about here more in a little bit. But when we're talking about percentages, this is nice because we have a huge range in the AMDR. And I'm glad that somebody thought of this because there's a certain reason why we have these ranges. And I purposely left in the children ranges for any of you out there who have young children um, or, you know, uh, children age four to 18. So you can see what the protein distribution will be for them. So we see with children, according to the AMDR, ages one to three, that of their total daily intake or their total caloric intake, we want to have them at a five to 20% protein intake. Children ages four to 18, we're looking at a 10 to 30% total daily intake, uh, 10 to 30% of the total caloric intake of that individual. And adults, we're looking at 10 to 35% of the total caloric intake, okay? So the reason why we have these big distributions is due to the inverse relationship of caloric intake and protein. That means when you are actually eating in a deficit or you're eating less calories than your, it, for your body to support its natural function so you're going to lose weight, you actually need to increase the amount of protein that you're intaking. And that is for the fact that while you are trying to lose weight, your bodily systems still need the same amount of protein to do the functions to be able to optimize whatever it's doing, transferring protein or uh, moving things, acting as protein synthesis, synthesizing hormones and those kinds of things, all the functions we already talked about. Your body still needs those same amount of protein and amino acids to be able to do those functions. So if you're starting to bring down your caloric intake, you actually wanna up the ratio of protein that you're taking. So when you're gonna start seeing that 20%, 25%, it's actually when the caloric intake is going less, less and less. Another kind of nice thing with that, if you are trying to lose weight, protein has a high thermic effect. It's harder for the body to break down protein. So you actually expend more calories digesting protein than you would carbohydrates and fat. So it actually plays in your benefit there, okay? So a lot of people kind of get confused with that. They're like, why is there this huge ratio? Maybe people that are eating way more calories eating way more protein, it's actually the opposite. You still need that protein in your body to aid those target tissues and those structures and those synthesizing hormones and those kinds of things. So you still need those proteins coming in, even though you're in a caloric deficit. Um, so to give an example of just using these percentages, I give an example of 10% of somebody's diet. So say if you were eating, if your diet was 2000 calories, and this is you eating at maintenance. So 2000 calories, you don't gain or lose weight. 10% of that would be 200 calories, which is going to be 50 grams. So now remember, I'm figuring these numbers out. It's divided by four because remember, there's four calories per one gram of protein. So that's how you're going to figure out the difference between your calories needed and grams needed, right? Because if you are monitoring your uh, calories through like my fitness power or something like that, I want to recommend it. Just eat a good distribution of you. But if you are an individual that's prepping for a bodybuilding show, or you want to watch your calories, do X, Y, and Z, you're most likely going to identify that you're going to need to eat X amount of grams of protein. You won't watch the caloric amount. Okay. So now we talked about general requirements for general populations. So let's talk about general requirements for our active individuals and our athletes. And this is coming from the International Society of Sports Nutrition. What we just saw before came from the AMDR and then before that came from the ACSM, which was actually developed from the AMDR. So what we see for general requirements according to the ISSN for athletes is they want to have a larger distribution of protein they're going to actually need to utilize about 1.4 to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight. So we can see an example of this, our 175 pound male, he's around 80 kilograms. It was like 79.5, it was, it's around, it's 80, okay? Um, so I see that the, the ratio, if I'm gonna be on the low end is 1.4 and on the high end is gonna be, you know, 2.0. So 80 times by 1.4 is going to be 112 grams. And then 80 times by 2.0 would be 160 grams. So the difference there is 448 to 640 calories. We still see it's not 300 grams of protein coming in, right? It's still not a, the amount of a lot of individuals having come in, especially our athletic folks who think that they need to eat 250 grams of protein. Now, it's also important to state that we should definitely strive to at least have 65% of this protein coming from those complete sources, those complete amino acid profiles. So if you're a meat eater, the easiest way to get by it is through animal sources or some sort of animal flesh, because you're going to get an, a quality amino acid profile within there, especially from your eggs and things like that. Also, I mean, lean meats, honestly, red meats too have a good distribution or a great or have complete amino acid profiles for the essential amino acids. 
Um, we're going to talk about athletes in more depth on the next slide, and we'll talk about there really why athletes need that increased protein amount, even our endurance athletes. But I wanted to give a little quick blurb for our protein or uh, the protein needs for our active vegetarians and vegans, our athlete vegetarians and vegans. So these individuals actually may require more than the two grams of protein per body weight, uh, two grams per kilogram of body weight. And that's for the fact that a lot of time they are not getting a complete protein source in. They're having to do it through a complementary source. So complementary sources mean that this food has these essential amino acids. This food has the remainder of the amino essential amino acids that are in this food. So I eat them together and now I have developed a complementary protein. So the bioavailability of these kinds of food sources is not at the same standpoint as meat is, right? So they're not getting the same amino acid profile. Oh, well, they're getting the same amino acid profile, but probably not in the same amount. And it's also not as easy for the body to digest or be able to utilize these things within the body. So a lot of times that's one of the reasons why our vegan, uh, especially our vegan athletes need a higher level of protein than two uh, grams per kilogram of body weight. Also, if they're not watching their caloric intake, a lot of individuals who are on a vegan diet, um, they're very nutrient dense diets, but they're not very energy dense diets, which is on, it's fine, right? All of us Americans eat way too much energy anyways, way too many calories. But if they're a vegan athlete and they're not monitoring their caloric intake and they're eating till they're full, they actually may not be achieving the total caloric intake that they need for their athletic demands, which then what we saw earlier with individuals in a caloric deficit, we actually need to raise that protein intake to be able to allow the body to have the amount of protein and amino acids to support its basic functions and also the anabolic functions that we want as an athlete. And this is not to say that vegan athletes are difficult to do or to, to be able to succeed. I know tons of individuals that are savage vegan athletes. Um, so we already talked about the complementary proteins. So when we talk about the, the increased risk of inadequate energy and taking one of the reasons why we need to increase that protein level, individuals who are vegan athletes also may be at increased risk of uh, deficient calcium, iron, zinc, and B12, any kinds of you know, uh, nutrients that you're gonna be getting sort of dominantly from meat. There's lots of fortified grains and stuff out there that now have this kind of stuff in there. Vegans and vegetarians understand how to get these things. Um, but if you don't understand, make sure that you're looking into figuring out how to get calcium, iron, zinc, and B12 into your diet. Uh, also, there's going to be a decreased amount of creatine in the uh, athlete and the vegan athlete's diet because creatine is maintained in meat. Creatine, I believe, in Greek means meat. Um, books always say that. I can't remember if that's correct, exactly correct, but something around there. Um, but you can easily fix creatine through creatine supplementation and those kinds of things. And other foods that, uh, that are in the vegan diet do have small amounts of creatine as well. It's just definitely not the amounts that you would want for athletic performance. Um, and just a brief overview of what the vegetarian types are. We have lacto-vegetarians. Those are individuals who are willing to put dairy in their diets. We have ovo-vegetarians, individuals who are going to put eggs in their diet. Um, these individuals are, it's much easier for them to be able to get the protein needs they need because honestly, egg protein is one of the best sources of protein you can have. And then lacto-ovo is allows dairy and egg. And then pesco-vegetarians are individuals who are uh, putting fish and seafood in their diet. And then your vegans are nothing of animal source. And then there's levels of vegans as well. Am I still on this one? I am. Okay, so to continue on with the protein requirements uh, for athletes, um, what we do, well, first let's just talk about the reasons why athletes would need more protein. Okay, so we already talked about that amino acids contribute for about five to 15% of fuel burn during exercise. So the amount of protein needed for energy rises as our caloric expenditure rises, right? So if I am doing some sort of activity, I'm running, I'm sprinting, I'm doing whatever, the energy expenditure that I have rises, which means now that even though I'm still only using five to 15% of protein, the amount of protein that's being used since the expenditure is higher is also higher. So that's one of the reasons why we need uh, more protein in the diet for our athletes. And even so for our endurance athletes, even though our endurance athletes are not breaking down, they're definitely breaking down muscles, but they're not breaking down muscles and building them back up to the standpoint as our strength and power athletes, right? It's obvious in the body frames, right? Our highly, our high elite endurance athletes are much more slim, type one fiber type, more of that kind of thing, right? Um, but they definitely break down muscle, so they do need protein from that. But also, since they are an elite endurance athlete or they're an endurance athlete, that energy expenditure is rising due to whatever event they're doing, triathlon, 
uh, Iron Man, those kinds of things. So then the protein distribution that's coming from amino acid oxidation for energy is also increased, which is one of the reasons uh, besides protein synthesis and anabolic factors of muscle tissue that an endurance athlete might need protein. Uh, another reason why athletes in general need increased proteins around amounts is it's generally throughout the endurance. Oh, well, we already time talked about that, but throughout any kind of activity, you're depleting glycogen, right? And if you don't have any fuel stations or things like that to replenish the glycogen in your body, which is that main energy source that we're utilizing, um, we may need to rely on uh, 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 protein a little bit more. We don't want to, if we can figure out a way to maintain our glycogen levels, that would be more ideal, but sometimes you just can't get around it and that glycogen depletion is going to happen. Also exercise causes more than usual muscle damage. So we need that protein to build it back up and all kinds of other factors that are gonna take place uh, within the athletic system. Essentially, athletes are just doing more than what we're doing and they're gonna need more carbohydrates, they're gonna need more fat and they're gonna need more protein. It's across the board. Um, so when it comes to protein requirements for athletes, um, I'm pulling this information now from the NSCA. So you see I'm bouncing around a little bit, but certain organizations are going to have better protocols or a better understanding of how to do things for different populations. And the NSCA is definitely, and the ISSN are definitely going to be good for uh, our athletes. Uh, what's good about the NSCA is they provide nutrient periodization protocols. Now in the sense of periodization, when it comes to uh, strength and conditioning coaches, we uh, talk about periodization in the fact of an annual training cycle for somebody. So say we have a year long training cycle of a workout program. Throughout that cycle, we do not do the same thing every single day. We are going to progress, regress, lateralize, do all kinds of things. We're going to do what we call periodize it. Different periods are going to focus on different things. Maybe one period focuses on hypertrophy, one focuses on strength, one focuses on endurance, one focuses on uh, power, right? Or whatever it may be. So you have to manipulate your training protocols with sets, reps, intensity, and those kinds of things to adhere to the goals that you're trying to achieve from that cycle. Or even more simply, you're going to think about an athlete within the different phases that they have within their, within their entire uh, athlete career. Typically, they're going to have an in-season, in uh, off-season, a post, well, an in-season, post-season, off-season, and pre-season. Those are the four phases that we go to. And within each one of those phases, we're going to have more training, less training. We're going to have training focused on this compared to this. And it's also going to depend on the kind of athlete that there are. So what we do with our athletes now, we are also going to create some sort of nutrient periodization to match the periodization that they're doing within their exercise protocols or their practices or whatever sport performance it is. So we're able to fuel them correctly for what they're doing at that standpoint. You don't want them just eating the same thing over and over and over again at the same caloric load if I have drastically increased caloric expenditure through whatever training protocols or sport performance protocols that I'm doing. And on the other side, if I've drastically reduced my training protocols because possibly I'm in a postseason, I'm letting people rest, I don't want those caloric intakes to be super high because then that person's gonna put on accumulated body fat that maybe I don't want. So the seasons that I'm talking about within this lecture is going to be our preparatory phase, which is our preseason, our competition phase, which is our in-season, and then our transition phase, which is our off-season. I'm not talking about post-season. Post-season for us in the strength conditioning world usually only lasts max of a month, and it's a time to give the athletes some break, uh, give them a break from what they've been doing. They've been focusing on football this entire time. They've been going to practice. They've been doing strength training. They've been focusing on their diet for it. They've just been so over-consumed with it that we just like to let them go. And just stay active, you know, maybe go do some yoga, go play open rec basketball, do whatever you want, stay active, but just kind of let yourself, you know, let loose. And typically for me, I know not all coaches do this, so don't like, you know, get mad at me. I let them like, you know what, don't go crazy in your diet, but have some fun, right? You know, eat, do what you need to do. Don't focus on it. Don't stress about it. Stay relatively healthy the best that you can. But, you know, let yourself have a mental break from what you've been doing. So that's why I'm not talking about postseason in this lecture. because That's typically how I handle it. But going into our nutrient periodization, another thing for our athletes, and this is the one reason why I really like NSCA uh, and their protocols, because this is how I've done things. Um, I base caloric intake and macronutrient distribution based off someone's lean body mass, not their total body weight, but their lean body mass. The lean body mass is essentially everything else in the body but the fat, right? So the muscle, organs, 
uh, uh, skin, those kinds of tissues. Like, you know, essentially muscles, organs, bones is the best way to think about it is your lean body mass. Um, and then body fat would contain the rest. I understand there's fluids and stuff in the body, but let's not get super nuanced right now. So the lean tissue in the body is really what calls for the dominant source of energy in the body. So for instance, there's ways to calculate people's basal metabolic rate and total daily energy expenditure. A total daily energy expenditure is just the amount of calories that somebody burns in a day, okay? So if you ate at, some, at your total daily energy expenditure, and say it was 2000 calories, you would not gain nor lose weight, theoretically, okay? However, there's a lot of calculations that only look at somebody's, maybe their sex, their age and their height to identify what their uh, basal metabolic rate is, okay? But there's ways to identify their basal metabolic rate based off those things. But in my opinion, and from what the research says, honestly, too, is if you're able to take into consideration their lean body mass and calculate their total daily energy expenditure or their, that way, you're going to get a more accurate number because their lean body mass is really what's calling for that energy. And within the sense of protein, the lean body tissues or the lean body mass is also what's calling for that need of protein as well. So I really like to focus my protein distribution based off of somebody's lean body mass, which is what the NSCA does here. Now to be able to identify somebody's lean body mass, you will need to identify their body fat. This is why it's not generally good with a lot of general populations because you're not gonna have that access information. A lot of our athletes are going through some body composition training or body, body composition testing. A lot of our recreational athletes are coming to our rec center and getting their body fat taken. If you're working with a personal trainer, a personal trainer can do it. And you're gonna be able to identify the difference between your body fat weight and your lean body mass, okay? So essentially how you would do that is say, if you have a 175 pound male who's 10% body fat, you would just go 175 times by 0 0.10. That's going to equal their uh, body fat, which I believe would be 17.5. And you just do 175 minus 17.5 and that would be their lean body mass. To do it even quicker, you would just go 175 times by 0.90. I always like to identify body fat compared to lean body mass though. So going into our nutrient periodization cycle, we see in the preseason for our individuals, we like to see a distribution of 1.2 to 2.5 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. So this is a higher number than what we saw before, but we were only taking in, we were taking in consideration entire body weight, not lean body mass, which is going to be a little bit less than total body weight, right? We also see that with our weight loss individuals in preseason that we're going to have higher numbers of protein for the exact same reasons that we already talked about. The, the body structure is needed. It actually increases the thermic effect and then is going to actually aid in that weight loss. And it also creates a blood sugar stabilizing effect. It controls the hunger response. Okay. So we see, and it's also important to remember that individuals of different sports, as we'll see here in a second, are going to call for different protein needs. Your strength and power athletes are going to need more protein than your endurance athletes. But within your endurance athlete, your elite endurance athlete will need more protein than your less elite endurance athlete. So it's you figuring out where that person kind of falls, okay? And again, it's widely distributed. Uh, somebody with more muscle mass on their body is going to be able to utilize more protein. In our competition phase, our in-season phase, we see that the distribution is 1.7 grams to 2.0 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. Again, of lean body mass. So strength and power athletes, we like to see at the higher end of that, okay? So 1.7 to 2.0. Uh, I apologize, this was supposed to be 1.2 to uh, 2.0. That's a little typo on my part. And your endurance athletes are going to be 1.2 to 1.7 per gram of uh, lean body mass, okay? Uh, I apologize for that typo. In our transition phase for our off-season phase, we're looking at 1.5 to 2.3 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. And how we're going to look at this is we're going to have on the higher end of that if they're doing a hypertrophy-focused off-season program, they're trying to increase muscle mass, okay? We would do the lower end of that if their program is geared towards endurance or cardio, right? Those more uh, caloric, the less building of muscle kinds of programs. So to give you an example, we have an athlete who's 175 pounds again, who's 10% body fat. To figure out what his lean body mass is, I put it all together here in a nice little equation, right? Because we need to get into kilograms. So essentially you do, you find that 175 times by 0 0.10, you subtract that number from 175 with whatever it equals, and then you divide it by 2.2 and that equals 71.6 kilograms. So to figure out the distributions now, we see that we're going to have 71.6 times by 1.5 on the low end of the off-season phase, which is 107 grams. 
And then for the high end of the 2.3 grams, we see 71.6 times by 2.3, which is 165 grams, which is 428 to 660 calories. Now, if you remember the numbers that we had previously coming from our general requirements, these numbers aren't drastically different, right? They're very, very similar. So they work out well, um, even with not taking into consideration somebody's lean body mass. I just very much prefer to take it in to consideration. So we'll kind of bruise through this a little bit. This is not necessarily what I'm super uh, trying to get across with this lecture, but we'll talk about a little bit of muscular development and recovery and timing of protein. So we've already kind of said this, but to have the biggest effects from your protein synthesis and the intake and all utilizing the amino acids, the highest standpoint that they can, not having that extra leftover, not developing those metabolic by byproducts and all that crazy stuff that I already talked about. We want to try to evenly distribute, just trust it, well, distribute protein throughout the day. I'm sorry, I just finished this uh, PowerPoint before coming here. It's been a busy week. <laughs> but we want to have them even, evenly distributed throughout the day. Okay, so if you had 80 grams, try to distribute it if you're eating three meals throughout the day, four meals throughout the day, however you're doing it. If you're an individual who intermittent fast, like I do, I intermittent fast, I have an eight hour eating window, I try to distribute my protein intake throughout that eight hours evenly, right? I don't try to take it in all at one time. Also consuming foods with high quality protein is the way to go. We want to try to increase the intake of complete proteins because this is going to aid in protein synthesis because we already know having all essential amino acids, we said this earlier, at one time simultaneously is going to optimize protein synthesis, okay? So when it comes to post recovery and like intake, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on with taking in protein before, during, and after workouts, okay? Uh, there definitely is a benefit to having a mixture of a carbohydrate and protein meal, especially after your workout that can aid in protein synthesis. But the whole thought process of the anabolic window and you have to get something in within an hour has been disproven. Your protein synthesis is upregulated for 48 hours after a workout. So you're able to utilize protein coming in at a higher standpoint uh, than normal for up to 40 hours. Yes, getting it in at the earlier standpoint is going to be better, okay? Also, more importantly after a workout is re, uh, repleting your glycogen stores, right? So it's more important, in my opinion, not a lot of people's opinion, to, re, uh, to replenish your glycogen stores, which is the energy source that you've used throughout your workouts, right? So the best thing that we do see post-workout for a, a drink or a shake is having a carbohydrate protein mixture. And we see a three to one ratio or four to one ratio is acceptable. So three parts carbohydrates to one part protein. And again, we said that 20 to 48 grams uh, at one time is kind of what we're seeing. And again, if you're the smaller individual, you're not taking in the 48 grams, right? You wanna be on the lower end of that. And the reason I have this little uh, picture here of a uh, 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 nutrient label is it's from a basic protein supplement. Just, uh, I'm not gonna name which one it is out there, but you see per one serving, it has 52 grams of protein. So if you're an individual who's trying to gain weight, maybe you're you know a little bit skinnier, like I need more protein to be able to build up all this stuff. That extra 30 grams that's coming in is honestly just gonna make you have really expensive pee is how one of my uh, old professors used to say it. Um, and it's going to cause those metabolic products to develop. It's going to aid in fat storage on the body and all those kinds of things. So we've already talked about individuals who may need increased levels of protein. So athletes eating in a deficit of your total daily energy expenditure, vegan athletes. Also, we didn't really get into it. I want to do my whole lecture on youth athletes and protein because the whole idea of like peak height velocity, peak weight velocity and growth and maturation taking place along with strength training protocols and practice and those kinds of things actually is a crazy uh, factor in protein intake as well as overall uh, caloric intake. So um, we don't need to run through these hand by hand. I just provided some quality uh, uh, sources of protein on here. These are uh, more sources for our individuals who are down to eat uh, meat, seafood, and those kinds of things. We will have this saved on the video vault for Global Connection. So if you want to come back to it and see it, it'll be up there if you want to go through these. Um, these are all quality sources of, of protein. And then I have good sources of plant proteins for you vegans and vegetarians out there as well, um, coming from grains, legumes, seeds, and nuts and vegetables. And there's all kinds of good stuff online about different sources of protein that you can eat. Um, again, in my opinion, just eat real food, right? Get your sources of whatever it may be from a natural food source so your body has adapted and evolved to be able to process it. 
So this is just a quick review. Um, since we're running a little low on time, I'm not gonna go through it. Essentially, what we need to talk about is that protein is meant to be an agent that's going to be aiding in anabolic processes to help build the tissues in the body, repair the tissues in the body, maintain the tissues in the body. We want it to synthesize hormones. We want it for those things. We don't want it as our main source of energy because we saw all the negative effects with that. We also know that an inadequate caloric intake equals uh, protein burned as fuel, which is not ideal. We talked about that at the beginning. Um, so the protein requirements that I talked about are assuming that you individuals are having an adequate intake. So the requirements given are believing that you have the proper amount of other macronutrients coming in as well as the proper amount of calories coming in. And this is why carbohydrates have a protein sparing effect. If you are ingesting the proper amount of carbohydrates, they're gonna be utilized as energy, thus sparing the protein to be utilized for the functions that we wanted to use of. We already talked about what happens to the excess protein, I think multiple times. I think you're all gonna be you know, geniuses in molecular, I don't know, whatever, in that kind of stuff. Sorry if we're going in the weeds there. Uh, we talked about protein intake depends on multiple factors such as activity level, athlete type, body size, all those kinds of things. We also want it evenly distributed throughout the day and not all at once. And protein timing can be beneficial. The way I explain protein timing and nutrient timing in general is there is a very, very small amount of the population that really need to do it. If you think of a big bell curve in that small little area over here, that's like the small amount of people who are getting those scores, that's going to be a whole other bell curve. And when you're on the small area on the other side, that's who I believe needs to utilize uh, uh, protein timing. As long as you're getting good nutrient, good macronutrients throughout the day, along with your micronutrients, and you're not eating until you feel like a piece of crap and those kinds of things, you're going to be doing all right. And with that, is there any questions? Any opinions on collagen? On collagen. Uh, so uh, collagen uh, can definitely be beneficial. I am not super versed on the utilization of it. I know that it can definitely help. Uh, it's a good source to be able to utilize as a supplemental factor. Um, just make sure to utilize it in the distributions and the uh, uh, intake recommended. Don't no overuse it. Um, my girlfriend, who is a very, very, very high wizard when it comes to uh, supplementation and utilizing those kinds of things, is a big proponent of collagen. I just haven't done too much research into it. I'm excited to hear you do intermittent fasting because I do as well. Let's go. I've been doing it for seven years. <laughs> BCAAs generally contain only three of the nine essential amino acids. This works because the extra of the three can be converted to the other six, question? Um, so the benefit of the amino acids is not for the fact that they can actually be turned, they, yes, uh, again, any essential amino acid can be turned into another non-essential amino acid or essential amino acid. But when you are taking your BCAAs is we know that protein, so this is where I would have talked more about uh, the utilization of uh, supplementation. But BCAAs are the limiting factor when it comes to protein synthesis and the amino acids in the body. And then of the BCAAs, it's leucine that is the limited factor that is going to aid in uh, optimizing protein synthesis. So while you're not getting all those essential amino acids in there, uh, those other six are going to be doing other functions. But the BCAAs are what are really, really helping out with uh, protein synthesis within the anabolic factor of the target tissue. And of those three amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, leucine is definitely the limiting factor for those kinds of things. So that's really why, especially taking your BCAAs throughout your fasted cycle is going to benefit with that and maintaining uh, the anabolic factors that you want to take place in those kinds of things. Uh, I take the BCAAs at 5.20, then do CrossFit at 5.30 a.m. Is this a good idea? Uh, when do you break your fast? I think you'll be all right. Uh, so a lot of people, uh, are you having, so hmm, that means you're getting a good amount of your food. Uh, what window, what time do you close your fast at? So are you doing 16 hours? So are you eating until like 7.30 p.m.? No, no later than 8 p.m. Okay, so in my mind, especially if you're getting a good amount of your calories at that 8 p.m. time, you will still be fueled enough. And I believe that the body is going to adjust to your fasting to utilize the calories that are coming in to do a 5.30 a.m. CrossFit class. And having those BCAs is definitely going to benefit uh, the protein saving effect on it. I honestly am pretty crappy with my BCA intake. I don't do it that much. 
Um, and I do early morning workouts too. And I have, I've actually gained more lean muscle mass in the amount of time that I've been doing intermittent fasting, but N equals one doesn't mean that it works with everyone. But I think your thought process of taking the amino acid, the BCAAs right before CrossFit would definitely help in not having so much degradation take place, uh, uh, in your muscles and those kinds of things. I'd also say if you want to get about it too, to make sure, even though the BCAAs are the limiting factor, uh, when it comes to, um, uh, protein uh, uh, breakdown and degradation, those kinds of things, and AIDS and not that happening. You can also buy EAA or essential amino acid complexes, so you get all nine of those amino acids in there, uh, essential amino acids as well. All right, uh, so uh, thank you for coming today. We're going to get out of here. Um, I'm going to go sit in a sauna because it's been a long week for me. I'm going to relax. Um, so we have intro or basics of the ketogenic diet on what's our date? Do you remember off the top of your head? So I believe it's in, it's October. in October. So it's we will, coming up soon. Yeah, so we'll have one. I've already started the uh, lecture on it, so please join us for that. Um, this video will be posted on the video ball to make sure you can get those protein sources and things like that. Uh, if you ever want to email me directly, uh, that's totally fine. I always answer questions, and my email is going to be uh, wellbeingonline at wsu.edu. If you ever have questions about any of this kind of stuff, or, hey, I thought about this, uh, or something like that, please hit me up. I actually very much inter uh, enjoy interacting with you all. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of your night.